Howdy. Welcome to the Texas A&M University College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs STEM Education Series. Today, Professor of Immunology and Pathobiology, Dr. Ian Tazard, will present Living with Bugs. In us, on us, all around us, we live in a world filled with microbes. And while many are beneficial, some can wreak havoc. Today, Dr. Tazard will distinguish between those two and teach us how to maintain the healthy bugs while avoiding those which might cause us harm. Welcome, Dr. Tazard. Thank you, Tori. Yes, I'm going to talk about living with bugs. I hope you're not here to learn about insects, because of course we use that term to describe many insects. I'm going to talk about microorganisms, the organisms that cause disease, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and uh, sometimes even protozoan parasites. So we're talking about microbes here, a single um, microscopic, very, very small organism, sometimes single-celled, um, and of course the most typical examples are our bacteria. We call them, we also call them germs, which is a very old-fashioned term, and also bugs, which is sort of really just jargon. But these organisms, these microbes, these microscopic organisms are everywhere. Believe it or not, they dominate our world and they dominate our bodies. We're not aware of them, but the fact is they're there. And in recent years, scientists have found out more and more and more about these organisms. And there are a lot of interesting and surprising facts that have recently come to light about this world of microbes. They're on every surface. They're on the floor of your classroom and the ceiling and the walls and the seats. But most importantly and interesting, they're on the surface of your body. Now, what are these organisms? As I mentioned, most of them are bacteria, uh, small single-celled organisms that can grow and live uh, really without a lot of nutrition. We find them in the soil, we find them in the air, as I'll explain. Um, but there's also a few molds. You know that if you leave um, a piece of jam out or something like that, it'll get moldy in a while because these molds, which are a form of fungus, are circulating in the air. And they also live on our skins and in our surfaces and in our, inside us. And then, of course, there are the viruses. Now, viruses are much, much smaller than the other organisms, much smaller. You cannot see viruses under a microscope. They are so small. Um, so here's some pictures, actually, of, of, of some of these organisms. You can see these uh, round organisms or, or bacteria. They come in different shapes and sizes. Some are long, some are short, some are round, some are, are little spirals. Uh, bacteria are, are single-celled organisms but you can see them under the microscope. Viruses, on the other hand, are much, much, much smaller. This diagram shows the relative size of a bacterium, a fairly typical bacterium, and the red dot shows the size of a typical virus. So if you can only just see the bacterium down a microscope, you're not gonna see the virus. So, Viruses are very different. In fact, viruses, some people argue they're not even living. They're little constructs. They contain genetic material. You've probably heard of DNA. Surrounded by a little coat of protein to protect them. But we're going to focus on bacteria. Uh, as I indicated to you, they are single-celled organisms. Uh, they feed on organic matter. They can absorb nutrients through their coats. They are very tough. Many bacteria can survive for a long time in places you wouldn't imagine. Places like very hot climates, very cold climates, on dry surfaces. 
as I indicated to you, we find them on the walls, on the floors, on, the, uh, on plants, on animals, on clothes, our body surfaces. Uh, this diagram, for example, shows some of the bacteria that are living in your mouth. You know about them, because sometimes you get, ba get bad breath. That's because of the bacteria. Sometimes you get rotten teeth, and that too is because the bacteria start eating away at the enamel in your teeth. So, yes, there's a lot of bacteria in your mouth and on surfaces like that. Now, you know about bacteria. You've heard about them because they cause disease. Some bacteria are not content to simply hang around. Some bacteria can invade your body, cause destruction, damage tissues, damage cells, and make you sick. We know about bacterial diseases, diseases like tetanus or diphtheria or some of the wound infections. If you get a, a cut or a scratch and a wound is infected, in many cases, those are due to bacteria. But believe it or not, we need bacteria. We need them in order to survive. All these bacteria that live on the surfaces of your body perform very, very important functions. Now, we call these bacteria, we collectively call them the microbiome or the microbiota. And uh, we are associated with about 10,000 different species of bacteria live on, and as I'll explain later, in our body. Now, what this means is that think of our bodies as made up of cells, right? Think of we're, we're made of brain cells and liver cells and skin cells and so forth. But when we count the cells in our body, they may, the bacteria may outnumber us by as much as 10 to 1. Recent recalculations suggest it's a bit closer to 1 to 1. In other words, probably at least half of the cells in your body are not yours. They belong to the bacteria. If we were to weigh them all, they would weigh about 3 pounds, which is about the same weight as your brain. There's a lot of bacteria living in your body and li living on the surfaces of your body. Let's look at some of these surfaces. Now, obviously, the most recognizable surface is your skin, right? That's the one we see every day. That's what covers us. But do bear in mind that it's not the only ex surface of our body that's exposed to the environment and not the only surface of our body that bacteria live on. For example, your respiratory tract, your lungs, right? Air has to get into your lungs. It has to get into your lungs freely if you're going to breathe. And the, your lungs have an enormous surface area, and bacteria live down there. The other, in fact, probably the most significant of these surfaces are the walls of your intestinal tract, right? Where food passes down, you have uh, an intestine and stomach and things like that. And they have very extensive surfaces. And they too, your intestine, is colonized by enormous populations of bacteria. Let's, uh, let's talk for, first of all, a little bit about the microbes that are currently living on your skin. Um, these are, this microbiome, this microbiota, is permanent. Several hundred different bacteria live on your skin permanently. They vary according to just where they live. Think about it, right? There's different sites in your body that have different conditions. The top of my bald head gets very dry. The bacteria that live there are quite different than the bacteria that live here or live between my toes. So these bacteria 
are very complex. They don't try to invade my body, they simply live there. They use some of the debris from my skin to eat. And if I don't wash much, they start to cause me to smell or my feet to smell, you know, the stuff between your toes. Interesting enough, washing, while it's good and important, does not get rid of these organisms. Why? Because they live deep down in your skin. And as we'll see in a minute, they're useful because they protect you against other invaders. So uh, let's just make a comment or two about washing your hands. Obviously, washing your hands is important. You want to get rid of the microbes that cause disease. By the way, the word we use for that are pathogens. Pathogens are microbes that cause disease. And only a very, very small proportion of the bacteria in our body will cause, uh, will cause disease. Most of them are content to live on the surface of your body. In the skin, um, Washing simply gets rid of the most superficial bacteria, the bacteria that are really on the outside. But your normal microbiome lives deep in your skin, in sweat glands and hair follicles, where washing doesn't penetrate. That's why surgeons are not content to uh, simply wash their hands when they're going to do surgery on, on someone. They want to wear gloves as well to keep the bacteria out. So even and hand washes and hand sterilize, do not sterilize your skin. There's still bacteria there. I have a couple of questions for you, sure. Dr. Zazard. The first one is, where do the bacteria inside of us come from? Are we born with them? And if not, how do they get to where they are? That is a great question. Um, <laughs> my hesitancy is that recent discoveries maybe suggest we're born with some of them. Um, which is a new finding and, and rather astonishing. But the great majority of them we pick up the moment we're born, when, when we're handled by our, by our mother, right? The bacteria on her, from her hands will get onto the baby's skin and colonize it. When they eat their first food, they'll get some bacteria. And, and it takes a while, it takes uh, uh, several weeks, maybe several months for the microbiome to get established. But basically, uh, newborn animals, newborn infants, pick it up from their environment. All right. And then our second question is, does hand sanitizer kill off our good bacteria that lives on our skin, allowing the bad bacteria to uh, propagate? No, I don't think that so. there's any ev evidence for that. Um, we'll talk a bit about killing off the good bacteria in a moment, but hand sanitizers, again, simply work on the very top layer of the skin and don't, as to my knowledge, don't do us any harm at all. In fact, they're rather good as a convenient way of getting rid of recently acquired microbes and viruses and things that we picked up that we don't want to spread to other individuals. Thank you. Okay. So, let me just make a comment about why these organisms are, are good for us. Um, essentially, what we have, the skin, our skin is an environment, an environment occupied by our, no, our microbiome, by what we call a normal flora or normal microbiota. They live there happily. They don't cause us any problems. They might make us smell if we don't wash too much. But on the whole, they occupy our skin. But think about a pathogenic organism, a disease-causing organism, a bad organism. It wants to come in and start attacking us. Well, it can. It gets outcompeted, competition. The, our normal microbiome actually keeps the bad ones out, especially because bacteria make their own antimicrobial molecules that will keep the invaders out. So as we'll see later, this normal microbiota that we need, in fact, is protective. It keeps the invaders out. The other thing that it does, and we'll maybe have time to talk about it later on, is that our microbiota keeps our immune system active, right? We have defenses. Defend us against microbial invasion. Defend us against pathogenic microbes. 
And those defenses have to be in tip-top condition if we are going to survive. Your normal microbiome keeps them in tip-top condition. Those normal bacteria that live on your surfaces will, in fact, keep your immune system stimulated, keep it on guard, and keep it ready to respond the instance a pathogenic organism gets in. So this microbiome is not something to, uh, uh, not something to dismiss. It's important. It helps you fight the bad ones. The good ones help you fight the bad ones. We have another question yes, related to that. So they want to know, is that why infants are more susceptible to disease because they have not developed uh, the full set uh, of bacteria? Absolutely. It's one of the reasons why infants are susceptible to disease. Uh, when, when a child is born, when a young animal is born, it has an immune system, a system of cells and molecules to attack defenders. But it's never been used. It's never been tried. And it takes several months for the immune system to come up to full activity. And in that time, young, young individuals, be they infants or other animals, tend to be more susceptible to disease. So obviously, um, one of the things about our skin, of course, is it's tough. It's impermeable. There are very, very few bacteria can actually get through intact skin. But of course, what happens if you get a cut or a scratch? What happens if the barrier breaks down? Well, then, of course, some of those normal microbiota can get into your wounds and might cause infections. Most times, however, remember, our wounds heal up without a lot of problems, especially little wounds, cuts and scratches. They don't normally get infected. But occasionally, of course, um, you know, pathogenic organisms can get in. Um, some of the things that, of course, affect your skin are, of course, washing, as I said, is, is fairly superficial. Um, even, even a good scrub is not going to get rid of the microbiota in, the, uh, in your skin. Uh, in the sun, the ultraviolet radiation kills some bacteria, but doesn't make a lot of differences. And as I say, disinfectants and hand washes, again, generally don't penetrate deep enough to make a long-term uh, long difference because the bacteria can get all the way down into the inner layer. So think about it. It's not really a, you know, like a surface of a plate or, or something like that that's impermeable. Your skin is permeable. Bacteria can penetrate in between the cells and live quite deep down. They can get in through hair follicles or sweat glands and live down there. So, and washing simply doesn't get rid of organisms like this. But the fact is we have about a billion bacteria per square centimeter of skin on your body, varying in different parts of it. But the skin isn't the whole story. The skin is really almost a minor story compared to your intestine. Your intestine contains billions of bacteria. There are more bacteria in your intestine than there are cells in your body. Remember I men mentioned they weigh, about, uh, they weigh about three pounds, the weight of your brain. Um, and they're important. They help digest some foods. Some of the foods we eat are very hard, would be very hard to digest if we didn't have the help of your microbiome. Your microbiome provides enzymes to digest your food. When they do that, they produce some essential vitamins, right? Vitamins, uh, in many cases, are coming in the food, but many bacteria generate in their intestine. They keep your defenses, as I said, in tip-top condition. All those microbes in your tummy are, in fact, stimulating your immune system and keeping you protected against other diseases. They control your weight, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and they influence the development of other diseases. And again, we'll talk a moment about that. So here's, uh, here's a diagram showing the sort of complexity of, the, uh, of your intestinal micro, microbiota or microflora. We use the terms interchangeably. 
For a start, you'll notice there's only uh, 10 to the 2, that's, uh, that's 100 to 1,000 bacteria in your stomach. Your stomach, remember, is full of acid, so back, not a lot of bacteria live there. It's not sterile, but there's not a lot. But as you go down the numbers of bacteria in your intestine and their complexity and diversity increases dramatically. So that uh, right down in your large intestine where digestion is concluded, you have 10 to the 12 microorganisms in a milliliter. That's 10 with 12 zeros, one with 12 zeros after it, number of bacteria, dozens of families. You can see the list here, many different families, very complex. And we don't have anything like some other species. Here's a cow. Cows eat grass. Grass is a great source of energy, but how do you get that energy out? How do you digest grass in order to get energy in order to, in order to grow? Well, we can't do it. Mammals can't do it. Animals can't do it. But bacteria can. And in fact, cattle are what we call ruminants because they have this enormous chamber in their intestine called the rumen, which is simply a fermentation vat where all these bacteria and microorganisms work on the grass to digest it and release the energy from it. It's a great technique. That's why ruminants are very successful. There's many different ruminants in the world, and they can survive well on grass because of their rumen. They can only survive because of the rumen because that's where they get their energy. Here's a, 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 dissected, uh, a, a dissected rumen from, uh, from a cow. You can see it's a, an enormous sack with several chambers uh, where food is sort of chopped up into little bits and prepared and digestion is concluded and so forth. So ruminants, cattle, are depend totally on their microbes for their ability to digest food. Likewise, what about other herbivores? What about horses, for example? Horses don't have a rumen. They actually have a stomach that's rather like ours, not very big. But horses eat grass, so where do they get their energy from? They get their energy by digesting the grass in their large intestine, in the cecum. It's a blind pouch down at the other end of the intestine. And when the small grass particles get in there, they are then digested by the very, very complex microbiome found inside the cecum. Again, it's simply a way these microbes help us exploit food sources that otherwise we wouldn't be able to use. They make a tremendous difference. Now, let me go back to something I mentioned a few moments ago. The fact is that your immune system keeps, or your, your microbiota, keeps your immune system in tip-top condition. All those bacteria inside you, and bear in mind, we have them too, not just horses and, and ruminants. All those microbiota, they, you know, they could one day, perhaps, get into your body and cause disease. So uh, that, of course, we have to fight. We have to be ready for it. We have to be prepared to, to defend ourselves against them. And a number of scientific studies have demonstrated very clearly that the presence of those microbiota keep our defenses in top condition. For example, pigs. Pigs that are kept in very, very clean surroundings are much, much less resistant to infections than dirty old pigs allowed to wallow in the mud, right? So, in fact, uh, that too much cleanliness uh, leading to a decline in your microbiota 
can cause you problems. The students would now like to know, um, can the bacteria inside cattle or horses who use it to digest the food, can that die off? Can it be killed? Yes, it can. Um, yes, and then you get a very sick animal indeed. Um, yes, there are problems. Uh, sometimes uh, if the food ferments the wrong way, uh, you, they can get really bad stomach upsets. Of course, you get colic mm -hmm. in horses that's associated with that. Um, so we have to be very careful when treating these animals that we don't mess up the microbiota of the rumen or the large intestine in the horse. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And they have a, a question that's actually a follow-up question too. Can bacteria be transplanted? Yes, they absolutely can. Um, that's uh, something that people are currently trying as, as our knowledge of the microbiota has, has increased. Um, it, it's certainly possible to transplant the microbiome. For example, uh, we talked about ruminants, right? That in fact, sometimes ruminants get really bad indigestion. Their, their rumen stops working, it stops fermenting and they, they would die. You can basically give them some fresh rumen content from another animal, basically transplant it. And as a result, you can get their rumen functioning again. That's and believe it or not, and we don't think we'll have time to talk about that, <laughs> in humans, people are now trying fecal transplants. Because again, in humans, if our microbiota is seriously upset, then in fact, we can run into really bad disease problems. So, and of course, the other uh, things you might have heard of are probiotics. We'll talk about them in a second. We're going to come to that. All right. That's okay. fascinating. Thank you. Okay. So let's get back to this issue that how your intestinal bacteria keep your body in uh, top condition. Basically, they're there all the time. Your body is aware of them. The, defensive, the defenses of your body are aware of them and it keeps our defenses in tip-top condition. We're ready just in case we get invaded by the microbiome. And uh, in fact, there's a constant conversation almost between all these bacteria in your intestine and your defenses. And, and they're really almost testing each other all the time, right? And normally everything goes fine if our digestive tract is working fine then we keep the bacteria out. Of course, when you die, your defenses fade and then those bacteria invade your body. But we can have another problem, one that probably many of you suffer from, and that is the development of allergies. Because we now believe that people who develop allergies are in fact they have some problems with their microbiota. See, allergies are a form of immune response. They're a form of our immune defenses. They're used, the, those, those defenses are used to protect us, for example, against parasitic worms. But normally, we wouldn't use them very much at all. But in individuals who develop allergies, all the evidence suggests that allergies are developing because we're too clean, because something has happened to our intestinal microbiome, and as a result, because our intestinal microbiome isn't stimulating our immune system properly, then we're developing allergies. It seems that when we mess up our microbiota, then we make a different sort of immune response. And as a result, we develop allergies. Now, some situations, of course, we can sort of prevent allergies. People, for example, living on farms generally have a lot less allergies than people who live in cities, probably because they're exposed to many more bacteria. People who have pets, are much less likely to develop allergies because, again, they are exposed to, to different, uh, uh, diff different bacteria in, in, their, in their microbiota. So they'd like to know, 
Is that all allergies? Does that include food allergies or just um, more like? Probably, probably includes all allergies, yes. Absolutely. Now, there are other factors. There's a certain, there's some genetic factors as well. But we're in the midst of an allergy epidemic now, and people are wondering why. And part of the, uh, uh, part of the problem is quite simply that we're too clean, that our microbiome is, is, has lost a lot of major components. Some organisms are missing from it that used to be there. And as a result, it's changed the sort of immune response we're mounting. And why up to what, 25, 30% of the population Goodness. now suffer from allergies? 30, 40 years ago, it was only about 5%. And part of the problem seems to be this issue of antibiotics, hmm. antibiotic use. Well, I think you've also given a lot of kids the best argument ever for uh, convincing mom and dad to get them a pet. That's right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Of course. <laughs> There's other great reasons for having a pet. But certainly, um, you know, just being working with an animal, letting, you know, if puppies lick your face, no big deal. Um, essentially, having a pet will increase the diversity of your, of your microbiome. But our problem, one of the problems that we think is central to this development of allergies is the fact that we're using too many antibiotics. Now remember, antibiotics are drugs that will kill bacteria. And they have been and are life-saving, right? They kill pathogenic bugs. They, in fact, have ensured that bacterial disease is nowhere near the problem that it once was. The problem is when the doctor prescribes antibiotics to you and you take them, then they're going to start messing up your microbiota. They're going to change it. Um, and as I say, some suggest that even obesity, as I'll explain in a minute, is maybe due to this, what we call dysbiosis. The fact that our gut flora, flora our gut bacteria are changed and uh, there's some interesting statistics. We use antibiotics very widely in, in this society, and there is some evidence that by the time you, uh, you children probably get about one dose of antibiotics a year on average uh, as they grow up. It also means, of course, that in third world countries where hygiene is much poorer and medical care is much poorer, allergies are much less of a problem. Allergies are a Western lifestyle disease. The other Western lifestyle disease that is associated to your, uh, with your microbiome is, uh, is obesity. The fact is that uh, when we look at the intestinal bacteria of fat people compared to skinny people, we find that the, that, that, that the bacterial microflora is quite different. Now, um, there's two ways of thinking of this. Uh, one is, uh, um, are the bacteria that fat people have, obese people have, are they more efficient at extracting energy from food? In other words, is it simply an efficiency matter? Or is it, in fact, a result of the obesity? Is it a result, for example, of eating too many sugars, of e ingesting too many high-calorie uh, components in your diet and secondarily affecting, uh, uh, affecting your microbiota. It's, it's not at all clear just you know, whether these changes in the microbiome are in fact cause and effect. But again, it may well relate to the same problems that we're seeing with allergies. In other words, Western lifestyle, excessive use of antibiotics, causes a change in your intestinal microbiota, and that change may eventually result and contribute to obesity. So obesity and allergies are directly related to your microbiome. But let me, uh, let me just mention, though, some, some other, uh, other links. I mentioned that our microbiome controls our intensity of our defenses. It controls our immunity. It controls how powerful our immune response is. It keeps our immune response in really good condition. But if it gets messed up, 
then we get changes like, like allergies. It also affects, however, inflammation. Inflammation, you know what it is when you hit your thumb with a hammer or, or, or you get an infection, right? Inflammation, the level of inflammation that you mount in your body is also controlled by your intestinal microbiota. And what that means is for many inflammatory diseases, diseases like arthritis and heart disease, your microbiome affects their severity. We know that people with arthritis have quite a different microbiome than people who don't have arthritis. We know that changing the microbiome in experimental animals will in fact affect the outcome of, uh, of heart disease. It'll affect tuberculosis, in fact some infections depending on the level of immunity. And of course, diarrhea and tummy upsets are in many cases directly related to changes in our microbiota. Diarrhea results from changes in our microbiome. So how about changing it? Can we fix this problem? You might have heard of probiotics. These are cultures of live bacteria that if you take them orally, then they can colonize your intestines and ideally promote your health. Um, and the classic example are unpasteurized yogurts. Right? Yogurt contains, of course, milk that's been treated with a bacterium called lactobacillus. And it's loaded with lactobacillus. And lactobacillus is a good guy. Lactobacillus uh, helps uh, your intestine, helps your digestive tract, and helps your immunity. So, so a lot of people take yogurt in an attempt to improve their microbiota. Um, the problem is that the dose, most cases, the dose is simply too little to make much of a difference. Um, and the other thing that happens is the microbiome regulates itself. So in other words, it's quite hard to change it one way or the other. It seems to, to be very stable, and it's sometimes very, very difficult to buy, even by eating probiotics to make a lot of difference or to make a long-term difference. In other words, we might make a short-term, have a short-term effect, and then it, it sort of goes back to the situation beforehand. So probiotics, certainly the theory is great, and we're still working on them. Some probably are better than others, and it's not entirely clear uh, what they, uh, uh, you know, how, how we actually get the uh, um, get the right result with, with probiotics. Um, let me just comment for a moment about the microbiome in your mouth. Right? The mic your mouth, of course, is part of your gastrointestinal tract. Um, many bacteria live there. They live between your teeth. They live on the tongue, on your cheeks. Um, and of course, as you well know, some of those bacteria um, are, uh, uh, will in fact cause teeth decay. Some of them will also cause uh, bad breath. Um, these bacteria can break down the protein in your mouth and release compounds that smell badly. Now, we have some defenses there. Your saliva has some really potent antibacterial activity. But again, you have a normal microbiome in your mouth that doesn't change very much. And, uh, and so we encounter it uh, uh, a, a lot. Um, and again, bad breath is, is a common uh, problem that many people have. And as I say, uh, tooth decay is directly attributable to changes in your microbiome, changes in your microbiota, especially as a result of, uh, uh, of eating sugary foods. Here's a thing we didn't mention. What about your respiratory tract? Well, you've got lots of bacteria in your respiratory tract. You got them up your nose, right? When you get lumpy green boogers, that's because of the bacteria. And uh, these bacteria, they live, you've got a good population up in your nose. Many of them a bit like your skin up there, but then as you get down to your lungs, they change. But your lungs are not sterile. Quite a few of these bacteria live in your lungs. There's not a lot. But they live there and seem to survive long term. 
And of course, the, uh, uh, if your immune system isn't working very, very well, uh, they, can cause, uh, they can cause disease. Uh, we can protect ourselves with uh, coughing and sneezing and things like that, um, which basically r remove some of the bacteria, but they don't remove the microbiome. The other thing to consider that's recently been found is that the microbiome of your airways also controls the development of allergies. Those bacteria that live in your airways, again, they keep your airway immune response healthy. They keep it working the right way. They keep it uh, on, you know, ready to go. But if you get dysbiosis there, if something happens to the bacteria in your airways, then you start mounting allergies. And of course, you get diseases like asthma and hay fever and things like that. So not only do changes in your gastrointestinal microbiome affect your development of allergies, but also changes in your airways. And they actually communicate with each other. In other words, changes in your airways can signal to your intestine and vice versa. So it's getting, it's getting, it's very cool, but it's, it's very complicated. Uh, I want to finish off by talking about a result, a scientific experiment that came out just about three weeks ago. And basically, I find it exciting because it says these bacteria aren't just on our surface of our body. They're in our body as well. And we're not aware of them. This was a study that scientists did where they collected blood from about 1,300 people and they extracted the DNA from the blood. Now remember, DNA is genetic material that is found in bacteria and viruses. And they tested that, that DNA. And what they found was hundreds, perhaps thousands, of new organisms in the blood of healthy people some of them were bacteria. There were quite a few bacteria new to science. But, and it's really not surprising, I guess, in some ways, the great bulk of these newly discovered organisms circulating in our body were actually viruses. That we seem to have a microbiome inside us. Remember, I mentioned we have a microbiome in our lungs, and there's evidence for other organs. But it now looks like that it's not just living with the bugs on the surface of your body, you're living with the bugs inside your body. What they do, what their significance is, we don't know. But it is astonishing that we contain a lot of microbes inside our body circulating in our bloodstream. And watch this for further developments. So let me summarize by uh, pointing out that we're covered in bacteria, our skin, our airways, our intestine, that these organisms have the potential to do both harm and good. And, and the one you need to think of yourself then is, you're not really just a human. You're actually a human plus your microbes, right? You're not an isolated individual. You and your microbes go together. Everywhere you go, your microbes go with you, and they don't change very much. Some people have called us super organisms because it's our body plus our bacteria and now perhaps all those viruses that are circulating inside us that in fact are working together for the common good. They benefit when you benefit and vice versa. So don't worry about those bacteria. They're good, they're important, you need them and they're not going away anytime soon, okay? Thanks. All right, we're gonna wrap it up with a couple of questions here, Dr. Tazard. The first one, it, they would like to know, um, if our microflora self-regulates, then why should we take probiotics when we're prescribed antibiotics? Why is that recommended? Well, certainly it's an intriguing that our microbiome is really quite hard to change. Uh, we seem to establish a pattern uh, as adults uh, and uh, Probiotics, can, it's, it's difficult to make a change. That said, it's not impossible. 
um, you know, that, and especially in a situa situation where you're taking antibiotics and you have transient changes in your microbiome, then in fact, uh, taking probiotics at the same time is probably going to help your microbiome get back to normal a little bit sooner than, other, other, than it otherwise would. And then I have another question. They say that um, their, their vet recommends that their horse takes probiotics to prevent ulcers in stressful situations. Why would that be the case? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, certainly probiotics are good. And oh, well, except that uh, remember that ulcers in horses and in people are caused by a bacterium called Helicobacter. And uh, Helicobacter is part of the normal microbiota, but it's called a pathobiont. In other words, given a chance, it'll cause problems. Given a chance, it'll cause ulcers. So probiotics sort of will help your body outcompete the, uh, the Helicobacter. Remember I mentioned how the, the normal microbiome essentially occupies that environment and keeps the nasties out. And so taking probiotics or giving your horse probiotics will in fact help outcompete Helicobacter and minimize, uh, minimize ulcer formation. So it might help prevent it? Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Okay. And then our last question, last one we have time for is, what are some lifestyle suggestions you have to help maintain a healthy microflora? Well, I think, I, I think much of it really relates to avoid antibiotics, of course, um, on, and read, eat a very diverse diet. Um, you know, uh, what is a little bit of everything and not too much of anything. And, uh, you know, watch, watch your calorie intake. And uh, as I say, obviously exercise hygiene. I, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you should stop washing or anything like that. But I think if you think of you have tummy upsets, think of the health of your microbiota. You know, think of, you know, if you travel to some exotic foreign country and eat foreign food, you know, that'll cause temporary disruptions in it and, and so forth. So uh, eat, eat wisely and not excessively. All right, that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Tazard, for this really fascinating subject material. If you'd like to learn more about subjects such as this, as this or other STEM or veterinary science related content, we encourage you to visit our website at peer.tamu.edu. -E and we look forward to seeing you next week.